All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I want to say a huge thank you to all our teachers live and on YouTube. I know it's a really odd time to be a teacher, a lot of strange things going on. Uh, so we so appreciate you joining us as we continue to showcase and celebrate such amazing and awesome people and organizations around the globe. So earlier today, in the last hour, we went to Cameroon on the coast to talk about the jungles there. We talked about some ecological uh, kids activities that people could get involved with. Some really, really cool stuff. And right now we are going about as far as you can possibly be on planet Earth from that to the Antarctic. We are joined by Hugh Griffiths. So he's joining us in the UK. He is a marine biologist with the British Antarctic Survey. And he's going to talk to us today about his adventures on one of the most unique and unbelievable ecosystems in the world, the deep sea off the coast of Antarctica. So Hugh, thank you so, so much for joining us today and take us away. <laughs> Hi, um, really nice to be here and get to talk to everybody today because um, I've been stuck at home like everybody else. So this is an amazing way to travel the world without actually leaving my house. And thank you to Jesse for inviting me. Um, the picture, the first picture I'm showing you is me in the middle of giving a talk when I'm allowed to stand up and walk around on stage and give talks. And I'm stood next to a giant map of Antarctica. And for anyone who doesn't know where Antarctica is, most people think of it as the bottom of the world. And the continent that you can see just above um, Antarctica there is South Africa. So Antarctica is the big white blob and around it is some slightly paler white, which is actually sea ice. So in winter, Antarctica doubles in size because the sea freezes. But the surface of Antarctica is actually covered in ice as well. And in some places, it's four kilometers thick. And the weight of the ice is so heavy that the whole continent is squashed down by about a kilometre into the ground for the weight of all this ice on top of it. So you might think not much will live somewhere so cold and horrible. But before we get to Antarctica, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and how I got to go to Antarctica. So the rather scruffy little boy, probably about eight years old in that photograph with the red circle around his face, is me. I know, I can't believe it. I've grown up into such a lovely man. But no, um, and I grew up in that small village that you can see in the photograph on the right, um, which is called Llanon, which is a Welsh name. So I grew up in West Wales. Most of you may not even know where Wales is, but I grew up by the coast and living by the sea had a huge influence on me. Um, when I was a very small child, my first choice of jobs was to be an elephant. I didn't know that people couldn't be an elephant for a living. So that was what I thought about for about a year. And then after that, pretty much wanted to work with the sea in some way. And the sea was at the bottom of my garden and it was all I ever really thought about doing for a living. Llanon, the village I talked about, is on the west coast of Wales. So Wales is the bit that sticks out from, this is England here, Scotland here and Ireland over here. And Wales is this part here. And growing up in Wales, not only do you have our own language and everything, but the sea is always close to you. But we also have beautiful mountains and everything else. But outdoors as a child was really important to me. And I was really lucky to be able to go out and enjoy adventures in, in wilderness. And the beach that I grew up next to on a good day looks as stunning as this. And it gets beautiful sunsets because it's in the West and it is really inspiring. And you can already see in that photograph piles of seaweed and things in the sea. So there's a lot of life in that photograph. And that was one thing that really made me keep going back down to the beach to play as a kid, looking in rock pools and seeing what's there. And to a certain extent, my life hasn't really changed. I'm just a bit bigger and the rock pools I play in are a bit bigger. And some of them need a ship to go and look at them. But essentially, I'm getting to do what I always wanted to do as a little kid. And I was obsessed with nature as a kid. And when I talked to my school careers advisor, I was told that I could study marine biology, but actually there were no jobs in that. And there wasn't a real career for someone. And actually I'm living proof that you can actually get to do the things you really love as a job, as long as you study hard in school and keep yourself sort of focused on what you really want to do in life. So I started off in Llanon, this little village by the sea. And when I went to university, I moved to a big city. So 
The city is Liverpool, which is where famous rock groups like the Beatles and things come from. And it also has a university that's very well respected and had a marine biology course. So getting to study marine biology was my dream. And what they did to us in the third year was sent us out to a very small island in the middle of the Irish Sea called the Isle of Man to a town called Port Erin, where there was a special marine lab with boats that we could use, diving equipment, all sorts of things. So for me, it was like a dream come true because I got to spend every day doing marine biology. And then somebody at one point in my final year of university said to me, are you going to apply for those jobs in Antarctica? And I turned to them and said, why would anybody want to work there? It's cold and dark and it's dark for six months of the year. I couldn't think of anywhere worse to work because I didn't really know anything about it. And it turned out that my first proper job after leaving university was working in Cambridge, so about as far away from the sea as you can get in Britain, working for the British Antarctic Survey. Now, it may look as if I've only, only travelled a few hundred miles in my life when you look at this map, but my education and my job have given me an amazing ability and opportunities to travel the world. So the next map is a map of the whole world. And Britain is a very small, that middle red blob. And then the rest of the world, any red blobs are places where I have done science. And yellow ones are where I have been for conferences or for work or for meetings. So through my work, I've been really lucky to be able to see a huge amount of the world. And those red dots at the bottom are the dots around Antarctica where I've worked. And I've been really lucky that I've been seven times to Antarctica and three times to the Arctic. So most people in their lifetimes don't get to go to these places once. So to have been there multiple times is a real pleasure. And I know that how privileged I am to get to go there. But one of the things I get to do is show other people how amazing it is. So this is me stood on an ice shelf. So there's no land underneath me. There's about 300 meters of ice, and that's floating on the ocean. And then that ship behind me is the ship that I work from. And when I'm down there, you get to see some brilliant things. So the wildlife in Antarctica is not afraid of people because there are no people that live naturally down in Antarctica. So all of these animals and all of these photographs I took whilst I was on different expeditions. And you'll see that there are whales, seals, penguins, albatrosses, and other types of birds. And that's what people think of when they think about Antarctica. The first animal that pops into most people's heads is a penguin. And you may have seen Happy Feet or other movies where the penguin is the star. So I do love penguins, don't get me wrong, and they are amazing, but they're not the animals that I study. But here is a quick video just to show you some of the whales that followed our ship one day. So this happens quite often where whales, seals, penguins will approach the vessel and you can see that they're swimming in the gap between us and the ice. And that again is frozen ocean that is that white background and that can stretch on for miles. And in fact, on my last expedition, there was so much sea ice around that we got trapped for three weeks without being able to go in any direction other than stuck in the ice. So Antarctica is an amazing place, but also nature is in charge. There's huge storms in the oceans. There's the frozen ocean. You have these amazing animals like these whales. It's kind of like having dolphins swimming next to your boat, but these things are about 10 times the size of a dolphin. And it was a beautiful experience. But you've got to remember that that water that the whales are swimming in is about minus two degrees centigrade. And the air temperature is about minus 20. So in Fahrenheit, I'm not sure what that is, but it's colder than most winter's days that we have in the UK, a lot colder. And so part of my job also takes me back to my childhood where I'm back on the beach. But this time the red blob in the middle of the picture is me and I'm collecting samples on a beach in Iceland. Now that's a brilliant thing because you don't need a boat to do that, you don't need a ship to do it, 
the, we needed a tape measure, some squares of metal called quadrats that you count what's in the quadrat. And then using my phone, I was able to photograph specimens as well. So on that beach, there was everything from um, snails and clams and small crustaceans. And we wanted to know how they were being affected by temperature and climate change. But also we were looking for plastics and microplastics on the beaches so that we can see how far the pollution that humans are creating is affecting nature, even in these really wild places. Now, this might be a bit scary. And I can imagine some of the teachers might be a little bit scared when they see this. This is a giant Antarctic sea spider. Sea spiders aren't actually spiders, but because they look like spiders, people call them sea spiders. And this one has 12 legs for walking and it's a male and the males are the daddies will actually carry all the eggs and the babies, which is very rare in nature. And these things are really common in Antarctica. And this one's about the size of a big dinner plate with its legs stretched out. Um, and these part of the ecosystem, so you can see one at the bottom of this picture. And in Antarctica, we have around 20,000 species that we think live in Antarctica. And obviously, you've got the ones that people recognize, which would be the penguin, seals, and cute and fluffy things. And they only make up about 90 of those 20,000 species. So although they're the iconic Antarctic animals, they're not really the main groups of animals in Antarctica. Then somewhere in the middle, we have the plankton and the small fish and things, and there's about 700 species of those. But taking you to the bottom of the sea in Antarctica, most of them, over 90% of the species, are the creepy crawly things that I study that live on the bottom of the sea, as well as that giant sea spider. Now, the bottom of the sea in this photograph doesn't look like the sea surface that I showed you with those whales swimming through it. The land and the sea surface in Antarctica is almost like a desert. It's incredibly cold and it's incredibly harsh and hostile. The bottom of the sea is still cold, but it's very stable. It's been cold for a very long time, for thousands or millions of years, which means the animals that live there are used to being very cold. So they've got very special ways of surviving that cold. But there are also groups of animals that can't cope with the cold. So although you can see a lot of different types of animals in this picture. You won't see a crab, you won't see a shark, you won't see a lobster. Those kind of big, scary predatory animals don't do very well in the cold. In fact, crabs and sharks tend to fall asleep in cold water, so it's not a good place for them to live, which means that a lot of these animals that you see in the picture, like this orange feather star here that looks a bit like a feather duster is related to starfish and they were very common in the time of the dinosaurs but as these more sort of advanced predators like the crabs and sharks evolved they tended to reduce the numbers of these animals that were less well protected against them in the rest of the world but in antarctica they dominate we can have these sponges like this one you can see here and it's covered in other life like brittle stars and soft corals and other types of coral. And um, these animals are really quite amazing. And some of these sponges, like you can see in this image, are very big, up to about two meters tall. And amazingly, some of them have been dated to be alive for over 10,000 years, which blows my mind because, you know, the Longest living things, if we think in terms of trees and things, can be thousands of years, but most animals don't live that long. So I'm going to start a video now, and this video is seafloor video from the bottom of the sea in Antarctica, and it varies between about 200 metres down, down to almost a kilometre down. So it's very deep, it's very dark, you won't have any natural daylight there, so the lights of the vehicle we're using to get the video are the first time a lot of these animals have ever seen bright lights like this. Some of them produce their own light. And I'll start the video and I'll tell you what we're looking at as we go along. So this is a big rock with a lot of sponges, some of those feather stars and big starfish on it. And now we've zoomed right in on a small piece of coral. 
and there's a um, sea squirt with a small crustacean on it. And now we're moving on something you might recognize, which is a fish that's living inside a sponge. And this fish is taking advantage of the fact that the krill that it's hunting have been lit up by our lights. And bigger animals, you can see a giant sea spider in the background, but we have a large octopus and a fish. And that fish actually has no red blood cells. It's actually one that has antifreeze in its blood instead. And these are those giant sponges I was talking about that are up to two meters tall. And they have large brittle stars on them. And the feather stars that I was telling you about, if you disturb them or scare them, actually swim. And these are the closest things to aliens that I've ever seen on planet Earth. And then this final image is of a giant sponge and an enemy garden. So if I show you this image, you can see these large sponges and soft corals. And this here is a sea anemone like you might find on the beach. But the difference is the two red dots that you see on this picture are about 30 centimeters apart, which makes that one sea anemone about a meter long, which is huge. And that's because in Antarctica, the water might be cold. But cold water is very good at storing gases. So it means that you end up with a lot more oxygen in the water there. So animals that don't have lungs or gills can get a lot bigger in Antarctica, which means you end up with giants. And something that's really amazed me is how many species I find that are new to science. And when we go down there, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the animals we pull up from the bottom of the sea are new to science. And if you look at the ends of both of these species names, you have Griffithsii and Huii. Now those of both species, if you look at my name, have been named after me because I was one of the people that found them. They're both sea cucumbers. Now sea cucumbers aren't the prettiest things in the world and they're related to starfish and those feather stars that I told you about earlier on. But I don't care how ugly they are. These are my favorite animals in the whole ocean because it just shows me that after studying marine biology for 20 years, there's always something new to learn. And at that point, we're heading up to kind of 20 minutes now. So I'd like to just thank you very much for paying attention to what I've been saying. And if you have any questions, we're going to move on to that in a second. So thank you. Fantastic. Hugh, uh, I have all sorts of questions, but we're leaving it for the kids, so I'll, I'll leave it to them. Um, but that was amazing. What a neat talk and what a unique ecosystem, something we've almost never covered here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. What a thrill. Uh, if you want to come out of screen share so you can see us have a bit of a conversation, you're welcome to do that. Um, and I'm just going to say for all our YouTube classes, we've got at least six other full classrooms joining us on YouTube. So 200 kids across the continent today. Welcome into all of you. If you have questions, share where you're joining from, share those in the chat bar. Uh, and and I'll look for them in just a minute. But I want to start with our live group. So I'm going to go to Miss Christie's class, uh, who had the single best facial expressions during all your <laughs> conversations in the background of anyone, because I can see all the background, half my fun. So joining us in Niagara Falls, Miss Christie, <laughs> just use that mic and you are good to go. <laughs> you're, you're muted still. You're muted still. Come on in. You got there. You go. The sea spider was the best. We are we're watching and reacting with my class, and the animals are fascinating. So we're talking in the chat about everything you're showing us, and it's it's amazing. This is incredible. Um, my students have well, they're mostly fascinated that you discovered two of the animals. They wanted to know what was that like. When did you discover them? How did you discover them? They're very fascinated with that. Cool. So those two species that I showed you come from my first ever trip to Antarctica, which was in 2006, so a long time ago. And it actually took about four or five years for some experts to really check that they were new to science. So for me, I'm not a sea cucumber expert. So to me, they just look like slightly ugly blobs of snot or something. But actually, when you show them to experts in museums, they can tell you if they've ever seen them before. And very often they'll use things like genetics or DNA testing to check that it is a different species. But it is amazing that those weren't the only ones. So I got two named after me because they found so many new species in the samples we gave them that they came back to all of us a second time who were on the expedition to try and name one after us again. And they named another species after the expedition. So we ended up with, I think, 10 new species of sea cucumber just from that one expedition. So 
I'm lucky enough, but my boss was also got one, got two, and my colleagues got two as well. So that's the amazing thing. In the UK, we'd be lucky if we found one new species in our lifetime. But in Antarctica, I expect to find 10 or 20 at least every time I go. How wild is that? And I want to stress for our kids at home that it is so rare to find new species in the world in general. There's a few ecosystems like Antarctica where it's fairly, you know, easy, quote unquote, to do that. Uh, but to have a species named after you is a really special honor. And so kudos to you, Hugh. That, that's a really cool story. And great question, guys, to kick us off. All right, let's head to Oakville for Maple Grove Public School. If you guys have one, come on in. We have prepared a few questions. So I'm going to see if Reese can turn his mic on and ask his question. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Uh, have you ever been scared of like any of the species in Antarctica? Yeah. Well, that's a really good question. So have I ever been scared of any of the creatures in Antarctica? And actually, yes, but not the ones you think of. The creepy, crawly, strange looking ones that I study because I'm trained. Actually, I'm tend to know what I'm looking at and how I should handle those. And some of those sponges are very spiky, so you have to wear very thick gloves if you're going to pick one of those up. But actually, the animals I've been most scared of, I've been on beaches in Antarctica with fur seals. And fur seals are very cute looking. But if you imagine a very angry territorial dog that wants to bite you if you get too close to its territory, and I've been sort of, I wouldn't say scared, but I'd say nervous around those because... It's not my job to work with those. So when I come across those, I have to be very careful that I don't upset them because their bite isn't worse than their bark. It is, uh, it's really bad. It's just, it's, their saliva is full of all sorts of germs that will make you very sick if they bite you as well. So it's, it is sensible to be afraid of being bitten by a fur seal. We are two questions in and we've already had scary seals and big bag of snot animals. Hugh, your analogies are fantastic and I appreciate them so very much. Um, all right, we're gonna go to Joe joining us in Mount Aurora, Wisconsin. Joe, come on in. I know you joined us for like 30 programs last year. It's nice to have you back and share it away. <laughs> um, what's the biggest animal you have eaten? And my cat has been watching the whole time trying to eat That's the fish. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So the biggest animal I've ever seen is a whale, but the biggest animal we found in my research are probably the sponges because they can grow really huge like we saw in that video and they weigh a lot as well. So we try not to catch the big sponges if we can because those are obviously very old and lived a long time. But occasionally when our nets are down, we do catch the big sponges, but we'd rather use video and things to look at those because we don't want to be damaging them. Very cool. You highlighted a lot of really giant things in the deep sea, and I just encourage all our classrooms when you're done, whether it's Blue Planet 2 or other resources online, uh, the scale of some of the creatures on the seafloor around the globe is just incredible. The roly-poly bugs a lot of us might have in our backyard can be this big at the bottom of the ocean. You've got all sorts of really, really neat things, so do check that out. All right, I'm going to go to Ms. Akbari's class, and then I'll come to YouTube for a few questions. Ms. Akbari, come on in and go for it. Hi. I have to tell you in my class chat, they keep, and I'm a grade one teacher, they keep saying, go Hugh. That's awesome. <laughs> um, they want to know two questions. One, how many endangered oh, animals live in the Antarctica and what, what is your favorite animal? Wow. So the number, I can't give you the exact number of endangered animals, but actually we're quite lucky in Antarctica that other than the things that have been hunted, like the whales and the seals, which are endangered, a lot of the Antarctic animals have never been commercially exploited by people. That means people haven't, people have done some fishing in Antarctica, but it's very well managed these days. Um, but we do have animals like the emperor penguins, which are on at risk lists because they live on the sea ice. And with climate change, there is a chance to um, actually sort of, that climate change will reduce the amount of sea ice and they need the sea ice to lay their eggs and rear their chicks on. So, and the second question I've already forgotten because I was too busy thinking about which animals are endangered. So if you could ask me again, that'd be great. Yeah, let me bring her back favorite in. Favorite animal that you've seen? Favorite favorite animal. 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 My favorite. Um, I would say my favorite is the giant sea spider because it is just so alien looking, but you cannot get away from, if you see a penguin chick or 
a whale, those things are still mind blowing. So even though I'm biased and like the things at the bottom of the sea, I will still stand out in minus 40 degrees C trying to take pictures of a whale or a seal or a penguin because they are just stunning. Yeah. I love when you can talk about a negative 40 degrees Celsius. When the temperature matches Celsius and Fahrenheit, you know it's cold. That's your instant sign. Um, and Miss Christie, again, disapproves of your liking for the giant sea spider. Um, too scary uh, in the background, but that's okay. I'm going to take a few quick questions from YouTube, and then we'll go back for one more round with our live classes. So there's a question from Miss Cross's class and Miss Pontoise uh, class. Any dangerous animals, any scary things that, uh, again, you mentioned the seal being something that you were personally, you know, wanting to be leery of. Is there anything that's deadly or poisonous or anything lethal out there? So that's amazing because we don't actually know with a lot of the animals we're looking at whether they're poisonous or not because maybe nobody's ever seen them before. So we have to be extra careful when we're working with those. The sponges I was telling you about actually because they are spiky and this, they're made of a type of glass. And so if they pierce your skin, it can actually leave you with bits of glass stuck in your skin for years. So they're quite dangerous as they are. But actually we have another type of seal called a leopard seal, which is really big and eats other types of seals and penguins and things. And those are dangerous. And unfortunately we have had one of my colleagues was killed by a seal when she was snorkeling near one of our research stations. So now we have to have very strict rules about how and when people enter the water and we have to check for seals and things. So we do take these things very seriously. But actually the biggest danger to us in Antarctica is the weather. Yeah. It's icy, it's cold, it can be stormy. And that is far more dangerous than any of the animals. Um, well, I mean, I can say on behalf of all our classes here, we're, we're very sorry to hear about your, your colleague, and I'm, I'm glad that there's precautions in place to prevent those sort of things from happening in the future. That's the first sort of a, a darker story we've heard about uh, exploration in Antarctica. And again, it's a, it's a very dangerous habitat. It's a place that, like deep sea environments around the world, like space, a lot of preparation goes into this, and that's why this work is, is so important. And, and yeah. Um, question from uh, Alex in fifth grade wants to know what machines do you use to reach the bottom of the ocean floor in Antarctica? How do you get there? Oh, that's a really good uh, question because I really like the technology involved. So some of our technology is really basic, like a fishing net on a long metal cable that we drag along the bottom of the sea to collect some physical specimens. But other technology we use, we use really amazing camera systems and video systems that we can send down that can also use sonar to map the bottom of the sea at the same time. So we can have a sort of millimeter scale of seafloor map, that all those sponges and things that you can see in 3D in our maps. So they're amazing. We also have underwater robots that we'll use to collect animals with robot arms and things. And these amazing things called gliders, which oceanographers use. And they essentially vehicles you can send out on their own for months at a time to collect data for you. Cool. And they occasionally come to the surface and send you the data back by satellite. Yeah. So even people who can't physically get to Antarctica can still do science in Antarctica using these amazing bits of technology. How neat is that? Uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that makes it, on, in this role, I get to work with a lot of people that are doing some of the coolest jobs in the world. I think we can all agree that you really do have one of the coolest jobs in the world, which is <laughs> awesome. Um, I do want to harp back on something you mentioned in your last answer before we take a couple more questions on YouTube. You mentioned glass sponges, so you mentioned the danger of them, but seriously, for all our classes, look up glass sponges when you're done this program. Some of the most beautiful things on the planet are glass sponges, and no one's almost no one's ever heard of them, so they're so, so cool. Um, we'll nerd out together. All right. Uh, one more question from YouTube. Mr. Savick's class, uh, they're joining in Alberta. Welcome in grade 10s. They want to know the smartest animal out there. What's the smartest animal in Antarctica? Sometimes maybe people, maybe not sometimes. Anything you can share. <laughs> it's not me sometimes, that's for sure. But um, actually, um, there are a range of smart animals. So albatrosses and things can live for 60, 70 years. And you've got to be pretty smart to survive down in Antarctica for that long. We have, um, we have, octopus that are incredibly intelligent they don't live a very long time but they have been found to solve problems and things like that so they can open jars and things and then of course if you can survive like an emperor penguin does in the middle of nowhere in antarctica that you've got to be pretty clever and pretty well adapted for that but in general i think antarctic animals are curious as well as clever and that's a really good sign of intelligence that actually the penguins will come and have a look at you and not just like a little look and run away 
they're studying you as much as you're studying them, I think. Yeah, very, very cool. Great answer, Q. Uh, all right, let's go back to our live classes, Miss Christie's class. If you have another one for us, just demute that mic and you're good to go. Yeah, um, my students are wondering about what it was like to explore underwater. They're wondering about how cold it was and if you ever got sick or had any um, anything happen because of the, the weather or the temperature there. Cool. So actually, my job is mostly on ships because I work much deeper than you can scuba dive. But I have other colleagues who do go scuba diving in Antarctica and they have amazing equipment. So they have a full face mask so they can still talk. So they're not got a thing in their mouth they could just breathe normally and they also have radio communications and they also have amazing dry suits so they're completely waterproof and they can wear really warm clothes underneath so they tend to stay pretty warm the people sat in the boat at the surface actually get colder waiting around than the divers do in the water very often and in winter they get to go diving under the sea ice when the sea is frozen and they actually use like a chainsaw to cut the ice and then climb in and go diving underneath the ice. So for me, I have got cold when I'm working there, but when I'm on the ship, I'm only ever 10 meters away from getting indoors and making myself a nice hot cup of tea or going and having a warm shower. So luckily I never get sick from the cold because we all look out for each other. And if someone looks like they're struggling in the cold, then we swap around so that somebody never has to get too cold. One of the great joys of this job is that we do a lot of programs with people in the UK and pretty much universally they either have a cup of tea in their program or reference it at some point. So thank you for that very much. Um, I'm going to take a, a quick question from YouTube, which is fantastic. Actually, before that, you mentioned scuba diving. I want to stress, we've got a lot of grade five and six classes today. And at 10 years old, you can start on the path to being a scuba diver. So if you want to open up literally 71% of the planet to potential exploration for you in your life at 10, you can start on that path, do amazing things and maybe end up in Antarctica one day with one of those dry suits. So I'd really encourage you to do that if you are so inclined. Um, I love this question from Ms. Whaling's class. Are you seeing signs of climate change in your visits to Antarctica? And is this affecting the ocean life you've studied over the years? Actually, it's really sad, but we are. Yeah. So I have colleagues who look at aerial photographs. So photographs taken from airplanes, maybe 20 or 30 years ago. So I've only been doing this for 20 years. So that's within my career. And we can see the glaciers retreating in those photographs and not just a little bit, like a lot. Some of them have disappeared in the time I've been working in Antarctica. Also, the seawater has got warmer and it may only seem like half a degree or one degree, it doesn't seem like a lot, but to animals that are adapted to living in minus two degrees centigrade, going up by even half a degree can really upset them. And some of them will die completely if you warm them by four degrees. Yeah. So if in my career, it's warmed by one degree. We've got to be really careful about what's going to happen in the next couple of decades. And it is a real shame, but it's also a real privilege to be working somewhere that is that sensitive to climate change that we're able to tell the world about what's happening. So we could be that warning or a lot of people use the phrase canary in a coal mine. So if the canary dies, but then you know it's not safe in the coal mine. So Antarctica is a bit like that. Things are happening faster there and the same in the Arctic. Yep. Uh, the one positive of this is that certainly the younger generation, the kids that are in these classrooms that are tuning in today, I think a lot of people assumed it would be my generation that would be the leading the charge against climate change, and that did not pan out. Uh, but the 16-year-olds and under, you guys are doing an amazing job. You know, million student marches. Uh, we've seen what Greta has done uh, all around the globe. Uh, governments around the world are taking that seriously now. So you guys do have a voice. You can make a big difference. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of changes in the years to come, but at least the public consciousness has shifted to understand that this is a serious problem something that we need to do something about and that action is starting to be taken so fantastic guys um let's go back to maple grove school if you guys have another one for us come on in hi hi, hi. one of my grade sevens grace has a question great hi um i was wondering what advice do you have for others who are interested in becoming a scientist or a marine biologist yeah Oh, that's a really good question. I could give you a whole hour just on that, but I'll try and keep it really short. I would say if you're going to study science, you should do it because it's your passion, because it is hard work and it isn't always the best paid job in the world. And a lot of parents go, why don't you go be a doctor or a lawyer or something? But I have had the best fun doing my job because I cared about this and it's something I'm really interested in. So if you're interested, 
then look into it. Do a bit of research about what that job really is like, not just the version you see on TV. And there's very often in science, there's hundreds of different jobs when you only know about one of them. So there's a science job almost for everybody. And if you don't like writing so much, you can do practical jobs where we have engineers who build our equipment for us. Or we have, even in Antarctica, we have to take people to cook, people to do the building work, people to do plumbing, people to do electrical work. So it's not just scientists that get to go and work in Antarctica. And I tell you that without those people, I wouldn't be able to survive there because if the heating went off, my DIY skills are not good enough to fix an Antarctic research station, but we have people who look after us. So again, even if you just like being outdoors, but you're not good in school, you could be an Antarctic field guide, which are the people that keep are my colleagues who are living in tents and things on the ice alive. So there are so many jobs where you can make science happen, even if you don't feel like you're going to get the grades in science that you think you have to have to get a PhD or something. So do it because you love it. And if you love it, don't think that there's no place for you in it. There's a place for everyone in science. Hugh, that could not have been a better answer, but try. It's something that we keep hearing from people in you know, NASA when they talk about being an astronaut. You don't need to be an astronaut. There's so many rules that help support that, make that role possible in Antarctica as well. Um, and so just a great message for kids today that are tuning in. Whatever you're interested in, I mean, Hugh, obviously, we can all agree, uh, lives and breathes science, loves this since he was a little kid, um, and is absolutely obsessed with nature. And if you're like that, fantastic. There's so many other options out there if you're not. Uh, Fantastic, guys. All right, Joe, come on back in, ask another, and then we'll go to Miss Akbari to wrap up in a minute. So, yeah, come on in. What was your favorite experience? Ooh, no pressure. <laughs> oh, no, this is weirdly easy because it happened on my last expedition. So there have been loads of cool things, like on my first trip, there were exciting things. and then, and But my last expedition to Antarctica, I was on a German research ship, and somebody had seen a whale, so everybody went outside to have a look, and it was gone. And we were stuck in the ice, so there was, a, and people kind of got a little bit bored of looking around, and so they all went indoors. Everybody else went indoors, and I stayed outside because I was, I was kind of used to it, and also I had the best hat; it kept me warmer than everybody else, so I was okay. And I just heard this noise over one side of the ship, and I went to look over the edge of the ship, and beneath me was a minke whale that had come up in the gap in the ice that the ship had made by just by the side of the ship. And I was looking down and it was looking up and it was just sat there taking a breath. So a minke whale isn't the biggest of whales, but they are amazing and they can live in amongst the sea ice without getting trapped. And this thing was just having a moment with me and I was, I could see it, it could see me and there was nobody else around. And I did try and shout for other people so they could get to see it, but everybody was inside probably having a coffee because most of them were German rather than British, but actually, that to me was incredibly special because that was a once in a lifetime thing where I, you couldn't pay to have that experience. It was just something I was in the right place at the right time at the other end of the planet surrounded by ice. So there's one animal popped up just in the right place too. How beautiful a story is that? Um, what was the hat? If everyone else goes inside, you have this magic hat. What's going on? It's probably quite a Canadian hat, actually. It's one that's fluffy on the inside and has the ear flaps that you can do up under the, underneath. And it's actually not, it, it was just, I get too hot if I wear it back in the UK. But if I wear it in Antarctica, I'm actually wearing a second hat underneath it because it's so cold. But that's enough for me then. I can stay outside for a long time. But then I do need tea. Tea is essential. Tea is essential. Um, before we go to uh, our Ms. Akbari for one more question, I want to note uh, for our classes, in, and certainly in Canada and Ontario, if you go out to the east coast of Quebec, you can actually see minke whales. Won't be quite as incredible an experience as Hugh had in Antarctica, but minke whales are very common there off Gaspé, a beautiful place, uh, first place I ever got a chance to go whale watching, so it's a really nice experience that you guys could have too. Uh, the biggest question we're getting on YouTube that we haven't covered live so far is, Antifreeze blood. Tell us about the antifreeze blood, but that just sounds so epic. So it is amazing. So these animals have evolved first in warmer water than the Antarctic. So they've moved into Antarctica, and there are two problems. Well, one big problem and one big advantage. The, the problem is your blood will freeze up in those temperatures if you're a normal fish. And the advantage of living in Antarctica is the water is so cold, there's loads of oxygen in it. 
And the reason why we have red blood cells in our body is to carry the oxygen around because, and a lot of fish have the same thing. Whereas if you've got so much oxygen in the water, your blood can just get saturated with oxygen. It means you don't need that. So you take that out of the equation and you start to produce proteins like glycerol that actually stop your blood from freezing. And so they've got clear blood, but it doesn't freeze like other fish blood. Yeah. And one of the things that is really interesting to science is this, these proteins and things that the fish produce, could they be useful for engineering or building or food products or all sorts of things? So there's, it's not that we go out and catch the fish and use them for engineering, but once we've worked out what chemicals are involved, we can start to make those chemicals ourselves to answer lots of things. And the same with some of those sponges. If you're a sponge and you're sat there on your own and you can't move, then having chemical defenses are very useful to scare off predators. So being a little bit poisonous or whatever, or to stop bacteria growing on you. So many sponges and things will actually have their own antibiotics that they produce. Yeah. And so we don't want to harvest sponges to get antibiotics, but we do want to look at what chemicals these animals are producing so we can use them to help humans as well. Yep. So it's a fine line. We don't want to be going out down there to exploit the animals, but if we find an animal doing something amazing and we learn about it, then that might teach us things that we can use for other important things in the world. Yeah, I love where you took that answer. Uh, thank you, that was great. Um, all right, one last question. Ms. Akbari, come on in, wrap us right, up. I have, I have Charlie who's gonna unmute and ask his question. Go Your ahead, microphone is mute, Miss Sarah. Go ahead. Your Charlie. microphone is mute. Hold on. Your microphone is mute. Sorry, they're all unmuting. Wait. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Hi, Charlie. Your microphone uh, okay. is muted. Your microphone is on. Sorry. That's okay. It's happy for the video call. Plants oh, and uh, we don't hear what she said. Uh, um, so, Ms. Akbari, if you know Charlie's question, if you want to mute the kids, I can come to you and you can share it with us. And that could be a way to do it if it's being tricky for you. <laughs> okay. So, he's just asked you what type of plants have you seen in the Arctic or Antarctic, or if there is any? Oh, that's a really good question. But first I'll say, your class sounds like a penguin colony when they're all speaking at once, which is quite hilarious. As long as they don't smell as bad as a penguin colony, then I'll be happy. So plants are amazing in Antarctica because actually in the sea, we have seaweeds and algae, which count as plants. But on land, less than 1% of the whole continent doesn't have ice on it. So that's a tiny amount. And so you can only really have tiny plants. And also the big plants don't like growing in the cold. So back in the time of the dinosaurs, Antarctica was covered in forest. But now the biggest plants you get are mosses and you get some lichens, lichens as well. And you'll get um, things called liverworts, which are very simple plants and they're tiny. But that's OK, because the biggest land animals are actually just there's a wingless insect and Springtails, and if anyone's heard of water bears yes. or tardigrades, they also live in Antarctica, but they also live everywhere. They can survive the vacuum of space. So it's not surprising we find them. But actually, plants are very simple, but incredibly well adapted, the ones we find in Antarctica. Very cool. I'm so glad we got that question. One of my favorite things I've ever learned about biology in my life is you can go to the dry valleys of Antarctica, crack open rocks, and there are lichens that are living inside them. So in the most inhospitable environment that Earth has to offer, there is life, which is one of the coolest things I, I think that you can possibly know. Um, Hugh, this has been so, so much fun. Uh, yeah. We could do so many more questions all day long, um, but unfortunately, we're out of time. Time flies and you're having fun. Um, and so what I want to do to wrap us up is, uh, again, recommend to all our students, check out Hugh. He's online. There's some amazing uh, stuff that he shared uh, on a variety of channels on, on Google, so check that out. And then if you want to watch some amazing series to learn more about life in the deep sea and life in Antarctica, Frozen Planet and Blue Planet 2, check those out. Hugh and I were talking before the broadcast, and literally when the team wants to go and know what to film, they talk to Hugh. Hugh tells them where to go, which is super, super cool. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring in all our groups to say a big thank you and goodbye. Uh, Joe, Miss Christy, Ma Maple Grove team, Ms. Akbari, join me in saying a big thank you. Thanks so much.